Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is the next in our Growing Up in Science series, Beyond the CV. Uh, we are very fortunate to have with us here Professor Elizabeth Brennan from the Department of Psychology, uh, who leads a lab working on comparative and numerical cognition and educational neuroscience. And I will not give any more introduction because she is about to do that, but thank you so much for being here. Great. I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> So um, let's see, when I, we'll start from the very beginning. When I was a kid, I was really fascinated by monkeys. Um, and this is kind of a way that my parents kindled my interest in science by uh, promising me that someday I would get my very own monkey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that promise never came to fruition, but um, what it did mean is that then in high school, when I had the opportunity to take an animal behavior course, um, and which was rare to do in high school. Um, I had that opportunity, I took it, I loved it, and um, I found out about an opportunity to go to the field, to do field work while still a high school student. So this kind of um, continued things of me wanting to kind of uh, follow in the footsteps of Jane Goodall or, or something along those lines. I really thought I wanted to be a field primatologist at that point um, and study monkeys. Um, so that continued. I had a number of more opportunities, uh, still in high school and then um, in college, to study primates. Um, and even uh, upon going to college, I realized at Brown, my freshman year, that there weren't any faculty studying monkeys um, in the biology department, the psychology department, or the anthropology department, where primatologists are often found. Um, there wasn't anyone to do that with, and so I transferred here to Penn, actually, as an undergraduate. Um, and I had the good fortune to work with uh, a number of different primatologists, including Robert Seifarth and Dorothy Cheney. Um, and I was in the anthropology, I majored in anthropology. I also worked with Bob Harding um, and went to the field in Venezuela with Bob Harding as an undergraduate. And so I had all of these wonderful experiences and exposure to um, working with non-human primates in the field, but I also came to realize that I didn't want to do field work <laughs> during this um, as, I, as I was doing all this. Now, um, working with Dorothy Cheney and Robert Seifarth, I was really fascinated with um, thinking about how the primate mind works, how non-human primates think, and what's different about um, non-human primate cognition and human cognition. Um, but I still, at that point, thought I wanted to go into anthropology. Um, and I applied to various graduate schools, and there was this new program some of you may have heard about, I think it still exists, the New York Consortium of Evolutionary Primatology, um, that had just begun. I was in, I think, the second cohort of this in graduate school. And it was um, a link between many different universities in New York, so Columbia, NYU, CUNY, um, Hunter, and it was bringing together uh, all different people who study different aspects of primates. So um, there was a little bit of primate cognition, but a lot of it was behavior, a lot of it was morphology, genetics, um, so all different approaches to studying um, primates. And um, so I entered that program as a graduate student, but uh, also had the opportunity to take a course in psychology my first year in graduate school. So even though I was at Penn and working Robert of those three people I mentioned, Robert Seifarth, was in the psychology department here at Penn. I really didn't have much exposure to psychology, even um, uh, I took some upper level seminars, but I didn't, um, didn't take intro psych or any kind of basic psychology classes. Um, but while a first year graduate student in this program, uh, I took a seminar um, that was uh, one of the foundational psychology uh, graduate program courses in animal cognition. And it was Herb Terrace, Peter Balsam, and John Gibbon. And this kind of was a kind of revolution in my mind. These are three people who are all studying different aspects of animal cognition um, from a um, uh, very rigorous, empirical approach, but, but also uh, not totally behaviorist, you know, cognitive. Um, and uh, that I basically decided to leave this anthropology program and move to psychology during that first experience, and luckily I had a NSF graduate fellowship so I could move, you know, in, at an odd time <laughs> of the year. Um, but I moved into the psychology program at that point and realized I really wanted to study um, 
primate cognition, not from the kind of holistic animal perspective of all aspects of primate behavior and cognition, but more from thinking about the nature of um, thought without language and thinking about um, primates as a, uh, non-human primates as a model for asking about what's unique about human cognition and what's different and um, approaching it from that perspective. So that was a, a big change for me moving into the psychology department. Um, so um, as a graduate student, um, I still had broad interests in primate cognition and was um, thinking about a thesis project that was about um, categorization and how, what kind of categories animals form, um, what kind of different natural categories they form, and very much from the perspective of how monkeys see the world, which is the title of one of Robert and Dorothy's books. Um, so I was thinking about it from that perspective and then had a very serendipitous um, experience that I'll tell you about because it's just so quirky. Um, I was living in postdoctoral housing at NYU rather than living at Columbia. Some of you would know why, but uh, my husband, Michael Platt, um, was a postdoc at NYU. And so we had an opportunity to uh, actually live in faculty housing um, at NYU. And uh, Randy Gallistel and Rochelle Gelman were on sabbatical at NYU. And uh, they happened to be living on the same floor as us. And so I was watching them walk their dog and trying to get up the courage to introduce myself to them over the course of a year, <laughs> and uh, finally did. And um, after uh, dog sitting for them for a week, Randy and Rochelle took us out to dinner. And I told them, I pitched my, they asked me, you know, what, what are you going to do your thesis on? I pitched my thesis idea, what my current ideas were for my doctoral dissertation. And they said, oh, this sounds great, but why don't you redo the whole uh, experimental design and focus on number? Here's why number would make much more sense than doing categories, natural categories. And so basically, the experimental design that I had planned on, they thought was great, but that I should just sub out the whole content <laughs> and actually um, <laughs> you know, study it based on uh, these numerical categories. Ask about what kinds of, um, uh, ask about numerical cognition in monkeys using this paradigm. Um, so, uh, and, and that was very influential. I had actually already read, you know, many of their papers and was very familiar. Their, their, um, Rochelle Gelman is a developmental psychologist in this field of numerical cognition, thinking about the early primitives of math and what uh, babies and children come to the world with already before they learn the meaning of number words, for example. Um, and Randy was also um, writing all sorts of theoretical pieces on this topic as well. So. Um, so that really kind of was a big transition for me. I was very impressionable, as you can see, <laughs> as a graduate student. I, um, I basically did switch my whole thesis project, um, and it worked out very well. Um, the, um, I had been, um, I had also been interested in the same kind of experimental design looking at social categories. So I had gone to the, I had gone to this lab site to take photos of all different um, non-human primates to use as stimuli to ask about um, whether monkeys can learn about social relationships. And I was planning on using natural categories and social relationship categories and all of that, and did a little bit of it, but changed my thesis to this whole topic on numerical cognition. So in some ways, it's um, when I think about my career path and I think about um, the theme that's going <laughs> to reemerge, I started um, my deep interest that continue to today started from a very young age, and they continue now. And yet, there has been a lot of evolution and change in these, um, these themes. Um, and um, one of the big changes that happened besides moving into the field of numerical cognition, which then stayed with me throughout my whole career path, um, is also uh, beginning to incorporate a developmental component, which was also a hugely serendipitous um, turn of events. It was it was not planned. Um, so yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm curious because there are a lot of uh, grad students I know in the, yeah. in the in the audience. Was it? Did you feel it was inevitable that you'd be going to grad school? I know that you were ah. uh, you were you were obviously very interested in primate cognition uh, from a very early age. I'm yeah. I'm curious w w um, whether it was always clear to you that that was the way to develop this interest. Right. Well, it was always one possibility, but I certainly had doubts, as I'm sure many of you have had at different points. Um, I certainly um, entertained alternative ideas um, 
for a while as an undergrad, I was considering going to law school and started studying for the LSATs and was like, you know, uh, really thinking about this alternative uh, idea and not doing a PhD. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I didn't consider any other kind of like, I wasn't going to be a, you know, monkey trainer or something, you know, like oh, something sure. other than, <laughs> but I didn't, but it was more like I had other interests too that well, I might have gone in that of direction. Of course, it's yeah. just often, often looking from the outside, it seems like a fait accompli. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I in many ways, um, I was pretty kind of uh, sure. unidirectional or, or really had this, this plan and stuck with it. But there were certainly many points where I considered deviations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So didn't mean to take no, you away from the, the so explanation of developmental yeah. influences. So as a graduate student, um, I, I was very focused on animal cognition. And once I started this whole project on numerical cognition, again, kind of an opportunity arose where Susan Carey, um, a renowned developmental psychologist, uh, was moving from MIT uh, to NYU at the time. and um, came, uh, she heard about the work that we were doing on number and monkeys and came to visit and, and wanted to learn about it and hear about it and talk about possible bridges between her lab and Herb's lab. And as I mentioned, I was already living at NYU, um, so I thought, oh, this is great. I'm going to, and Susan actually, uh, even though I was a third year graduate student, I believe, she asked me if I would help teach her uh, animal cognition class which she does not study animal cognition. This was her idea was, OK, I'm going to learn animal cognition now <laughs> by teaching it. <laughs> and um, you know, she was starting a collaboration with Mark Hauser at the time and, um, and was really deeply interested in, uh, in the literature. But um, so we had this seminar on animal cognition at NYU. And I started actually um, collaborating with people in her lab and doing research in developmental psychology just as a side project mm -hmm. as, a, as a graduate student. Um, and that I still didn't realize at that point how much of a developmental component my research would end up taking on. And, and that, again, is going to, there's various different kind of opportunistic things that, that drove that deep interest, but also um, different opportunities. Um, so let's see. So, so still thinking about graduate school. I mean, that's basically kind of a, a nutshell of what was going on with me in graduate school. I was very, I, I was, Thinking about it now in terms of my own graduate students, um, it was a little old school. I, my first paper, first first author paper was published at the very end of my dissertation, which I would never allow for <laughs> one of my graduate students. Um, anyway, you know, I, I published my yeah first um, part of my dissertation uh, as part of my thesis in the last year of my dissertation, which, I mean, there are some fields that that's inevitable uh, given the... Um, the kind of work you're doing. But uh, in my field, that wasn't necessarily inevitable. It was just the way my graduate training turned out. Um, and yeah. Is it a, a dropping the bag approach in your selection? Because you started out kind of in a like social categorizing and then you went to numerical and then developmental? I think it was more the lab I was in. So I was in Herb Terrace's lab, who turned out to be a wonderful mentor for me but um, wasn't really focused on, um, you know, what's most important for this graduate student and how do I, like, I, I don't think he ever encouraged me to go to a conference. I hadn't gone to a conference yet. He went to conferences. I just mean, you know, I didn't go to conferences a lot during, um, during my graduate career. I just went to a couple. Um, and yeah, so I don't think it was necessarily, it wasn't that I took so many circuitous paths that it, took me longer or something like that. So my first paper was in science and that ended up <laughs> ended up like you know it, it ended up creating an opportunity for me that uh, again was timing. So um, my husband had already been doing a five year postdoc um, and so he really was ready to get on the job market whereas I was you know right in my last year of my PhD and so I should have been looking for a postdoc but you know, we wanted to be in the same place at the same time. So very luckily, um, my paper came out the week he was at Duke giving a job interview. <laughs> 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 so really, I mean, this is, it, the timing was just, you know, just on our side that um, they ended up creating a research faculty position for me at Duke instead of a postdoc. Now, that's something that, 
you know, I, I think my advice to people would be very different depending on what the circumstance was as to whether that's a good idea. For us, it worked out really well because um, I think it's hard. Postdocs are amazing things, and I do feel a little deprived that I never had a postdoc experience on the one hand. On the other hand, it's very hard to go to an institution that you want a faculty position in as a postdoc mm. in terms of um, the implications for changing status or, you know, it happens, but it's hard. Um, and so for me, it was actually, uh, and at Duke, their culture was such that they um, allowed research faculty to really be immediately part of the faculty in many aspects. So, so, and I was in a different department than Michael as well. So I was in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience, and he was in the Neurobiology Department. Um, so I was able to immediately go to faculty meetings, and you know, it was kind of, you know, I was given the advice by my mentors, my faculty members, mentors at Duke, to kind of forget your research faculty, behave as if you're not, and you won't be soon. <laughs> And that worked out. So, um, but anyway, so that was so the timing of that was um, was very lucky. Um, but I was very worried that I would get stuck in this research faculty position forever, and that's the concern: mm -hmm. either stuck in a postdoc or stuck in a research faculty position forever. If you have a reason why you can't move geographically or why it's not um, uh, preferable to move geographically. So I was very concerned about that. And so within the first year of my um, position at Duke, I um, started applying for um, other positions, for tenure track positions. And again, very lucky at UNC, which was physically <laughs> closer to my house even than Duke, happened to have a job opening at the time. And so I got an offer of a tenure track position at UNC and that and I could have taken it, it would have been just as easy for us, but uh, Duke ended up making me a position um, at that time. So again, these are things that, you know, they don't always, the, the stars just aligned in terms of those opportunities for me at the time. Yeah. Um, and perhaps the whole getting a paper in science <laughs> it, at the, to crown your dissertation is not also something that you're gonna advise all your grad students right. to count on. <laughs> right. Yeah, so the yeah, thing you about all need that. the timing was literally funny. I mean, it was, um, Michael was at a, one of these faculty dinners and like there's a, a, a TV news headline about, you know, garbage, of course. It's all, you know, uh, it was, yeah, it was <laughs> silly. But anyway, it was my research was like up there and, and somebody made a comment uh, not knowing that he, that it was my work. Like, oh, did you hear about these monkeys? <laughs> <laughs> these monkeys that can count from one to nine, you know? I mean, it was very, very uh. funny. Um, <laughs> so. So you became a faculty almost out of that space, but did you right. feel that you were, you thought you were defending something completely? Yeah, you have to pretend. <laughs> right. Like A little bit, a little bit, right. So I kind of, so first of all, I took six years to do my PhD. I had done the one year in the NYSEP program before that as well. So I think it was seven years total. Um, and then I was one year in this research faculty position and I was given a startup fund um, and that's another story, but, but so I had that one year that was kind of like a, a, a postdoc without a direct mentor essentially. But I certainly had a lot of advising during that year. Um, yeah, so I still had that period of time. But, you know, I was very unprepared in some ways. I had never taught a course, um, and the course I was about to teach turned out to be developmental psychology, and I had never taken a class in developmental psychology. So there were a lot of ways in which I had to, you know, learn by the seat of my pants. Um, so that's another aspect of this that's, that's kind of funny. Um, Ron Mencken was the director of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscientist, uh, Cognitive Neuroscience. He's a neuro cognitive neuroscientist who studies attention, um, and he had, was just starting this new center at Duke. And um, when he created this research faculty position for me, he said um, that, you know, well, you study monkeys and babies are kind of like monkeys. You've done a little developmental oh work. Gosh. I really need a developmental cognitive neuroscientist here in this program. <laughs> <laughs> How about I give you some research funds, a startup package, and you learn functional imaging and do it with kids. Now. There wasn't a lot of functional imaging going on with kids at that time, first of all, and I, you know, barely knew uh, where the lobes of the brain were. I mean, like, I really knew nothing about the brain. Um, so 
it was, uh, but of course I said, that sounds great. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> and so what I did was start an infant lab. So at, in Susan's lab, I had been working with children, with three-year-olds, um, doing early number tasks with um, various people in her lab. Um, but I had been seeing the baby lab that was happening there. <laughs> they were doing lots of infant research in Susan Carey's lab, but I hadn't been participating in any of it. Um, but I thought, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start an infant lab. So that first year as a research faculty member, <laughs> I had no monkeys, first of all. I mean, Michael had a lab. I could have used his monkeys, but I wanted to be independent in my research. Um, and so I started an infant lab, and I really worked my butt off, like, directly on the ground doing the research with undergrads. I had no grad students, obviously. Um, I had, a, I think, a full-time RA. Um, and undergrads, and uh, you know, but I would like get on the phone and call parents to recruit for babies, um, and just really was involved in every aspect of starting this infant lab. And in that year, um, we got one paper out, but it was that you know one paper with a brand new method, and um, you know, so that felt just like okay, I can do this. But I definitely felt like um, you know, I definitely was worried that I was faking it all the time. Um, I didn't have to teach large classes yet. I, it was a mm -hmm. research faculty position. I taught a seminar, I think, that first year. But um, Seems like a trial by fire. Yeah, it was. Even if you are new at the thing, because everyone is new at the thing. There, there, is, no, there is no prior work in, a, in right. an area. Um, I work with computers. I assume that working with infants is kind of harder. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're much less predictable. So <laughs> <laughs> if you have, you know, <laughs> yeah, if you uh, recruit 30 babies to your study, you still have no idea how many babies you're going to have in that data set. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, yes, but, um, and then when I got the offer at UNC, initially Duke's perspective was, okay, well, we can give you anything that UNC is giving you except monkeys. And Ron Mengen actually, literally, there was a whiteboard in my office. He came into my office. He drew a cute little picture of a monkey, and he crossed it out, and he said, ask me for anything else, Liz, but <laughs> <laughs> no monkeys. Um, but as the negotiation went on, <laughs> I ended up with some monkeys. So, <laughs> so then I had a monkey lab and a developmental lab, um, and, uh, and that was great. I was told by my faculty mentors at Duke that, you know, you're doing these, these two different lines of work, and to really, you know, prove yourself before tenure, you're going to need to have federal funding for both independently. So make sure you get separate R01s for both of these um, lines of work. Um, so I, I had good mentoring and advice, but also I feel like the, the bar was set very high, and I was uh, given this advice that, um, that I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't <laughs> met, but... <laughs> Yeah. Um, let's see. What other aspects? I guess another aspect of just thinking about um, the, I, I still study numerical cognition, so the same topic that I, early math and the primitive evolutionary foundations of mathematical thinking, um, and it kind of seems crazy that I'm still studying the same thing that I, you know, started studying after a dinner with Rochelle and Randy um, as a graduate student. And yet, um, I've found a way to make it very interesting for me by using many different methods. So I did eventually start doing functional imaging with um, students and collaborators, not on my own, um, but with kids, um, and using um, EEG and collaborating with Michael to do monkey physiology, um, to do all different kinds of methods approaching the same question of um, of these um, primitive foundations of mathematical thinking. So that's kept it interesting for me. Um, and I also think as a faculty member, um, you know, when you're, I, I guess you, you guys have some of this as graduate students and postdocs, um, but as faculty, I think that one of the things I really like about the um, career is that it is actually very varied and multifaceted. So it's not, you know, so at times I'm really focused on the research um, or grant writing or writing papers with students, but then there's the mentoring aspect um, or then there's the teaching aspect or then there's the figuring out how to 
uh, work with all of your irascible colleagues. And, you know, <laughs> um, so all of the university committees and different aspects of, um, of university <coughs> life that um, and now, for example, I'm the director of undergraduate studies for psychology, and previously I was the director of graduate studies um, for another program. So um, having all of these different components makes it, makes it really interesting um, and uh, keeps me interested, yeah. Your, your path sounds like a wonderful um, testament to how important it can be to to talk to people throughout throughout your um, throughout your path yeah um, how do you how would you advise graduate students or early career researchers um, to find those serendipitous moments yeah. that end up becoming careers yeah I think spending a lot of time with faculty who in your department you know or that collaborators, faculty, um, and trying to really be part of um, all of when colloquium speakers come, trying to spend time with all of them so that you've met them when you're moving on to other places. So I just feel like all of those experiences, especially as a graduate student, all the faculty that I met in small group situations, whether they were um, um, small dinners that Herb Terrace would occasionally invite me to go with, you know, faculty to dinner, for example. So if you can do that, if you can go as a graduate student or a postdoc um, to these small encounters, small conferences, in other words, not just the big ones, mm -hmm. um, all of those kinds of experiences have been so important for me. They, um, they have really uh, helped along the way in terms of and going, speaking from the other side, how does it feel as a professor? Like, what do you want to see in a student or a junior yeah. researcher when you are the seminar speaker or you are the, the person that everyone's going out to, to have lunch with? Yeah. Um, what, what, do you, what do you look for or what do, you, what do you expect? Because I know that a lot of students feel like the stakes are very high, then you really need to have something to say. Right. Um, and do, do you feel that way? What do you, what do you want from a student? Uh, well, don't know. I don't feel that way. I certainly don't feel like, you know, um, they've got to have a whole presentation for me. But on the other hand, um, you know, if it's a faculty member that you have something in common with, if there's something you can present about your research, that's actually the most fun part, I think, when I'm giving a colloquium and, um, and going and uh, giving talks when you're um, able to meet one-on-one -on -one with a graduate student or a postdoc or a small group and they're actually showing you data that you don't know about and is relevant to your research, that's the most fun thing. So finding those opportunities where you can tell somebody about the work you're doing, um, you know, if it's totally unrelated, obviously, it, it may or may not be interesting to them, but the uh, putting in names for people that you want to come here to give talks, talking to your mentors about inviting those people so that you can have those um, experiences and then asking the organizers whether there can be more s of these small group um, opportunities um, for for that would be ideal. Yeah. I'd like to open up for questions from the audience. So everything that you've told us about your story so far sounds like a lot of the stuff that has aligned over the linear dynamics. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's good. Let's see how the, the stars did not align for me. Apart from not having monkeys. Right, well, right, right. So, <coughs> right, so I didn't have any monkeys for quite a while, and that, that was challenging. Um, I've certainly had lots of moments of disappointment where grants didn't get funded um, or papers didn't get in where I wanted them to get in. Um, but see, I don't, don't dwell on them, so I just can't think of <laughs> Yeah, so there have been lots of moments like that, and, um, but um, I guess, and there's certainly been other challenges, things like um, upheaval in departments, the center directors leaving, um, people, uh, departments um, merging against our, against the department's um, wishes, uh, things like that where it felt like there were a lot of um, things out of my control or things that were um, challenging and making it harder to work. Um, but, um, but I think my approach has been to find other channels when those things happen. Um, so You said you have to change institutions when, you're, when you were in a place with no 
primate research. Yes. Well, actually, so what happened was I, I was given this research faculty position at Duke, um, and I was told that I could use other people's monkeys, but I couldn't have a monkey lab. Um, and so I really did just change, you know, I, I started an I infant lab. A, I meant in college, but sure. In college. Well, in college, it was more that, right, so as a freshman undergraduate, mm -hmm. um, I realized there weren't people to study what I wanted to study with at Brown, and so That's I right. transferred to Penn, yeah. It's kind of impressive. But, like, well, I, as an undergrad, I would definitely not have had there any There might of be a little bit more to that story, but we'll skip I that see. part. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but that is what happened. That is what happened. <laughs> Yeah. Um, um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I guess I've had a little bit of a tunnel vision as to what I wanted. But you're right that there are, um, and I spin it this way as these serendipitous things because it's, it's interesting how much of an influence some of, the, um, some of the moments had that could have gone otherwise. But, um, but um, I don't know that, you know, had I not met Rochelle and Randy, would I never have come to that particular study, I'm not sure, it might have still happened, um, and there's, you know, other examples, and, and what would have happened had I gone to Duke um, and not yet have published that paper, would they still have made the research faculty position for me? I don't know, maybe, yeah. but it certainly seemed like, yeah, the stars were aligned. Mm -hmm. Um, I had my first child while I was still a graduate student, um, but I was really, my dissertation was almost complete, so I was really just doing the final writing of, of things. Um, in fact, I think I even did my job interview at Duke um, before I gave birth, so I think we, we ended up staying another year, basically, after we had lined up the Duke um, thing. Uh, so it was, in some ways, a very, like, the perfect timing because I already knew my dissertation was pretty much done, but I still had funding. I had an NRSA, and so I could stay another year and have that extra time. Um, so that would be another thing to do, try to apply for a lot of independent funding. Like, if you're funded on your own, if you have an NRSA, which, um, you know, NRSAs can fund six seventh year grad students, they don't have to just be the traditional amount of time, um, that gives you a lot more flexibility. So that was one thing that worked out for me. Um, but I did have my second child pre-tenure, um, and that was uh, challenging. It was challenging being pregnant with my second son and teaching developmental psychology for the first or second time ever when I really didn't know the subject matter that much. I got the worst, ah, here's an answer to your question. I got the worst teaching reviews ever. I got, I mean, skewered. They, I mean, and some of it I'm sure was, you know, I don't know, uh, about being pregnant possibly, but, um, but some of it was absolutely warranted. Um, <laughs> they said things like, they wrote things like, um, Dr. Brannon is, um, um, yeah, you know, in their <laughs> reviews <laughs> to point out my, um, and, my <laughs> one of my uh, faculty mentors took me out to lunch, uh, out to dinner, yes, um, around my third year review, and said, Liz, I told you that teaching was not super important for <laughs> but I didn't mean <laughs> that you could <laughs> do this badly. You've got to turn it around, you know, before tenure. And he also showed me some papers, I think they were by, were they by Walter Michelle or Jean Galanter? I don't know, um, somebody from Columbia, because it was somebody I was familiar with uh, from graduate school who had published papers about the frequency of um in different uh, <laughs> paper, in different fields, and the fact that the harder the science you're lecturing on, apparently, the less often people say um. So kind of the more, I, I think it has more to do with the number of possible outcomes of your sentence. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, the, I don't know, uh, as to how frequently people say, um, anyway, apparently it's extremely hard just being conscious of it to reduce the frequency of, of this speech pattern. But, so it wasn't just that, but there were other things. I was, it was a challenging thing to teach that course, and I did turn it around, uh, but, uh, but that was a little bit of a wake-up call. What did I do? Um, <laughs> um, let's see. 
first time I, I noticed it. you say yeah. it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I say it uh, you do not too say frequently it anymore. But uh, I think I mostly just studied the content matter more. So I think it really was the case that I was attempting to teach some social development topics that I really had no familiarity with. And I found it necessary to know more of the original research rather than you know doing the awful thing of teaching from the textbook, which I was doing just out of, you know, by the end of a course doing it because I was uh, un unprepared and short on time. So I was writing grants and publishing papers and doing all of that and, and really it was taking to heart the advice that I was told that teaching reviews did not matter to get tenure. And so I thought basically I just have to be able to get through this. And once I kind of felt more balanced in terms of once I felt more prepared with, with grants, once I got the initial grants, for example, then I was able to dedicate more time to teaching. So really, you just you have to dedicate the time mm. to teaching. And now I really enjoy it. Once you have the freedom to uh, you know, play around with all of the, your different interests, it's not that I wasn't interested in teaching or didn't value it. It's just that I really couldn't um, focus on it because of lack of time. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I've, my lab has fluctuated a lot uh, in size, and I have really enjoyed the dynamics of a large lab at times. Um, I think I've had as many as four graduate students that were just in my lab at, at one time, and then, of course, some shared graduate students. That was kind of the largest, um, and then somewhere between one and three postdocs at the same time. So I've never had a huge lab like the lab that you were in, uh, but I... Uh, have definitely had a much larger lab than I've had now. And so I think it really varies based on the method and the time of career of the, the PI, basically. So right now, I I'm postdoc heavy. I have three postdocs, but only one graduate student. And I think it's, it works well. And, and pen, it depends on the graduate student funding model in terms of what you're, and how much funding you have. But uh, the grad, Penn is particularly challenging, I think, to have a lot of graduate students, uh, not just because, I mean, I can fund the postdocs, but the, there's a bottleneck in terms of accepting um, uh, a large number of graduate students because of the limited resources of the, the pot in psychology for graduate student funding. So I've found that to be, my lab is smaller in that sense than when it was at Duke because of that model. Um, and that's made me have more postdocs. But um, so basically, I think I like to have at least, you know, three or four full-time people in the lab. Um, and whether they're postdocs or graduate students or lab managers has, has varied a lot um, for me. What about undergrads at MIT? Yeah, so undergrads have always been a huge part of my lab. Uh, and as I mentioned, when I was research faculty and didn't have graduate students, it was completely run with me and undergraduates. And I've often had as many as 15 in a given undergrads in a given semester working in the lab. Uh, and um, I really enjoy that. I now tend to do a lot more of um, kind of tiered mentoring. So I meet with the undergraduates, but also they have somebody else that's co-mentoring. So one of the postdocs or graduate students is co-mentoring them as well, um, so that they have more daily interactions as well. Um, and we always have our lab full of undergraduates in the summer. There's, you know, developmental work is very amenable to training students, uh, and even monkey work we've always had undergrads as well. How would you advise students to um, engage with mentorship? Um, on both sides, uh, both as, as mentors. I guess it's never too early to be a mentor, but also yeah. in terms of finding finding mentors. Right. Maybe if, you're, if your formal advisor is not as hands-on. Mm -hmm. or Regardless of whether your, your formal advisor is hands-on, it's really important to have other mentors and to, uh, for graduate students and postdocs, to have multiple other faculty at your university that you're interacting with and that can be letter writers, so really get to know your work deeply. So I think going to more than one lab meeting, you obviously don't want to spend all your time going to lab meetings, but, but um, having somebody else that you consider unofficially as a co-mentor is still very useful just by going to their, their, um, their lab meetings. 
So I think that's very important. And then of course, yeah, beginning to be a mentor. So supervising undergraduates um, is very useful for grad students and postdocs. Um, I've really enjoyed mentorship as part of my um, career. I learned very on, very early on that your student successes are your successes. <laughs> and so I think that it's sometimes, um, uh, I, I guess I have seen in some circumstances where um, there's competition over authorship or competition over projects, but I, you know, in, in mentor-mentee relationships, and that kind of baffles me because I don't, I think that, you know, um, one of the ways in which faculty are measured is by how successful your students are, and so it's really important to, um, I mean, it's important for lots of reasons, but um, I, I find it uh, very satisfying and important to um, help your students succeed. Um, so, yeah, but so I think, yeah, what you all can be doing is looking for people outside of your mentor that, um, that can be additional support systems intellectually, yeah. It's very challenging, yeah. Um, there's lots of considerations, and I, um, and in our case, of course, dual career academic pebble, it was very challenging. So we, and we were not really looking to move. Um, it just this incredible situation came around. Um, in general, I think pe the basic advice is that it's easier to move before tenure than after tenure until you're at that level where people are trying to recruit you from all over post-tenure. Um, so you kind of, if you feel like you're at the wrong institution, you might want to do it right before tenure. And certainly it, the advice is typically to uh, be on the job market um, around the time that you're up for tenure so that um, when you have a competing offer, that's very helpful in getting tenure and in negotiating things. Um, so unfortunately, that is an aspect of academia that uh, competing offers are really important in terms of um, maintaining resources, um, getting an equitable salary, all of these things are, are really important. So when um, faculty who have never played that game, either because they haven't been competitive for um, alternative offers or because they're just um, too pure <laughs> and they know they want to be here and so they don't entertain mm -hmm. these, these um, alternative offers, um, they de definitely end up with lower salaries. So that's a very unfortunate part of our world, yeah. But moving institutions, I mean, there's tons of trade-offs. Um, it was much easier to recruit babies and young children to the lab at Duke. It was a driving culture. There were lots of stay-at-home moms. It was much easier to have a developmental lab, and that's uh, been a challenge uh, at Penn, so we've had to find other routes. Um, All those undergrads. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, <laughs> test undergrads, yeah. Okay, that's a very challenging question. Um, the nature of <laughs> the neural representation of, of uh, non-symbolic number representations, you know, what, how is it really implemented in the brain? Um, but I don't think we're gonna get there, and certainly not with the current work I'm doing at that, at that level. So um, one of the things, one of the new directions that my work has gone in, um, over the last five years or so has been the interface between um, education and, um, and cognitive psychology at the level of thinking about how can we harness the primitive number system um, to actually benefit uh, mathematical education. So a lot of our work is focused on trying to understand the relationship between um, what children are struggling with in the domain of um, math education and um, what the early representations that they actually don't need education for at all. Um, and so 
we've gone in various different directions where we, we thought we had you know, uh, found uh, one answer to this question and we're still um, struggling with it in terms of um, whether there are ways in which you can harness and train the approximate number sense to get children to um, have a stronger foothold into mathematics education. And so I think if I uh, found a way that that were really to, uh, to come to fruition, that would be really satisfying. Um, But I don't think I would ever want to just <laughs> lay it all down, right? It's um, it's it's the process, and it's yeah. You mentioned having to work with um, <laughs> curmudgeonly faculty <laughs> members right. and and other difficult people. Uh, do you have any advice for for us on how to do that? I've actually always really enjoyed that. Now that I'm coming, <laughs> now that I'm coming to the level where I might eventually have to like, you know, be in charge or rein people in, it'll be much less uh, enjoyable, you know, to, to get to that point. But I've always enjoyed the um, amusing interactions of having different factions on different sides of hiring <laughs> or just these kinds of these um, these things that take on a life of their own. Um, Certainly at Duke and, and certainly at Penn, there's always, I mean, they're really good people in both departments, and I really enjoy my colleagues. But it is really interesting to see people dig their heels into these different camps in terms of mostly around hiring or, or when these you sure issues you really. Gossip from, an un, from unnamed people. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the video camera off. <laughs> well, you've been at other institutions. <laughs> Um, any gossip? Uh, let's see. Just the kinds um, of things that we don't see as more junior researchers. The kinds of like what 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 it means to be to be working through politics. At yeah. Oh well, level. I mean, I've seen many things with faculty storming out of faculty meetings. Um, huge arguments over um, over hiring usually, or or tenure decisions, but usually mm -hmm. hiring. So, um, well, a lot of it is actually about the search. So not so much about who to hire, but about wh which area is gonna s you're going to search in. Mm. So um, that can be very touchy. So, you know, one group might feel that we need um, a cognitive psychologist who's a purely cognitive psychologist and doesn't use cognitive neuroscience as a method because we need to have you know, we need to be back to our roots of, of thinking about behavior and have, you know, that might be one position. And um, others would argue that, you know, our area needs a social psychologist and or um, an animal models person. And these kinds of arguments can become extremely heated and people can be very invested in them. Um, Makes sense. Yeah. If you are trying to find a colleague for yourself, right. of course. And so that's great. The co a lot of times it's because people want intellectual playmates, and that's mm -hmm. a good motivation. Um, but sometimes it's because they want to <laughs> replace themselves <laughs> before leaving a department, which I find very <laughs> bizarre. <laughs> but there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. Like, you know, coming towards retirement, I want to replace myself in exactly my mold. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, so those things are are interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, have you had any conflicts with colleagues or Huh. Have I had any conflicts with colleagues? I haven't really had any particular challenges with collaborators. Um, I had a situation once where I was writing a review paper with a graduate student and it was, I think it was for ticks, and so um, they have a certain number of references that you, I think it's 30 or something. And um, somehow, in the many iterations of this paper, one of the foundational papers had been removed from this reference list and was not discussed in the paper. And I got one of the most devastating reviews back from the author of that <laughs> paper that should have been cited that was like capital letters and, you know was like, I respected the work of Liz Brennan before I read this. 
Um, so I've had some situations like that that I've had to <laughs> smooth <laughs> over <laughs> or, you know, come to grips with. Um, and, you know, he was right. He should have been cited. But, um, but I can't quite imagine myself reacting that way in, in the same situation. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, no, I haven't really had any real problems with collaborators that I can think of. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, and I wish I had more time to focus on what my colleagues are doing and, um, and to interact more. We have a developmental um, lunch now, our talk series occasionally, where the goal is for us to um, interact more on the work that we're doing. I was thrilled when um, Allison Mackey was hired right around the time that um, I was being hired. I was running a search at Duke in developmental psychology, and she and I had just finished reading the applications, and um, she was my top choice for this search. And I was on a trip, and called, um, and and Sharon Sh Thompson Schill, who was the chair of the department, texted me, and said, um, and and told me that Allison Mackey was withdrawing from my search because she was <laughs> accepting the position at Penn, and I hadn't yet decided to come here. But um, but now she's my colleague and is right next door um, to me, and I'm really excited about the work that she's doing on creativity and persistence in children, and um, and she's collaborating with um, we collaborate with her on some functional imaging and kids um, work, and so that's really great for us. Um, and yeah. <laughs> that's a great thing about, um, and that's, I think, it might not be as dramatic or drastic in your own careers to have those two different things, but having a multifaceted um, approach, whether it's topics or methods or whatever, has been great for me because I can really, it can ebb and flow, and I can be super excited about one approach and kind of negative about the other at times, and never, not, you know, whatever, just less excited, um, and then it can switch around. So, um, so right now, I only have, I have a, a joint postdoc, Rosa Rugani over there, um, with Michael, who's working on a monkey project. And, um, but since coming to Penn, that's the only monkey work that I've been doing. So I kind of, even though I, um, upon coming to Penn, I was given the resources <coughs> that I could have started a monkey lab, I kind of decided to focus on development at this point. But I love thinking about those questions and playing with data that it's, it's very different, the kind of data um, that you can get, obviously, with uh, testing monkeys for thousands of trials compared to um, maybe 16 trials with an infant or 40 with a child before they're bored. Um, so it's very different, the kinds, of, um, the kinds of controls, the kinds of approaches and methods. Um, so I really love um, working with all of these kinds of data, but, um, but they're satisfying in different ways. And so at different points in my career, I've been more focused on one than the other. And, and right now, it's more the developmental piece right now um, than the monkey work. But, um, but hopefully, that will continue to ebb and flow. Yeah. I think we're about to be out of time. Would you like to leave us with any thoughts, perhaps, things that junior researchers think are important but aren't as important, or, or vice ah. versa? Well, so I think what's most important is to be passionate about the work that you're doing. And so um, while it's always good to be opportunistic about different uh, possibilities or um, openings that might happen, so I would never be so pure that you would not uh, take an opportunity like this research faculty position that came along um, for me, You've got to be able, or the fact, or you know, resources to do a, uh, a developmental lab instead of a monkey lab. You've got to be bendable and willing to um, to deal with the the cards that you're handed and the opportunities that you're handed. On the one hand, on the other hand, you must be passionate and inspired by what you're doing. There's no point in being in this field, this career of academia, unless you're um, having the opportunity to study things that you are really interested in. Um, so I think that that's kind of, you know, it, it's important not to be just thinking about, okay, what are, what are all these job searches in right now? Um, I should push my, direct, my research in this direction because this is what's most marketable. 
like that's not going to do you well in terms of um, in terms of sustaining your career. So, mm -hmm. I think finding the things that you're really passionate about and yet still being open to all of the different um, opportunities that might arise. Well, thank you so much for, for joining pleasure. us today, Professor yeah. Brandon.